There's a really particular challenge, I think, uh, as an artist in a TED Talk context, because I think it's been great today listening to the, the assorted conversations around the complexities of our world and solutions from a medical, engineering and scientific context. But I think as an artist, we kind of hate being placed in those crisp, clear sort of discourses and, and ideas because we sort of wallow in ambiguity and uncertainty and contingency. So I sense, I guess, what I'd like to talk about today is some of those contingencies and uncertainties in terms of art practice, but paying a little bit of a lip service to the TED Talk ethos, I do want to try and knit together what I do in relationship to some of those grander themes that we have been looking at today. So as Matt said, I make projects that knit together aesthetics, performance participation, and architecture. And my fundamental interest in drilling down in these projects is to try and understand people, which is really similar to a number of the other conversations today. It's just that I do it from a very different context. My interest is to create situations, spaces, uh, and intensities around which I am seeking to garner from people an unguarded moment. So the work that you're looking at here, which is being replayed as a little GIF, it's a project called Lean. And the key idea behind this particular project is that I'm attempting to make an artwork where vision is not the way in which you understand the world. So whilst you're watching, we can move on. I'll move on to the next image. What this work is actually fundamentally about is creating four spaces around which the audience is invited to walk up onto that platform and lean against it. And they look identical from the outside, but unfortunately for the audience, they're not. They're actually inflated at different levels. So you can lean against this thing and fall straight through, or you can lean against it and not move at all. And what I was really interested in with these projects was to try and build a sense around the fact that vision is not always the dominating sense around which your world is shaped or, or in terms of an information mechanism to tell you what's going to happen. And this project, again, was also about eliciting a moment of uncertainty, which I call the unguarded moment. So hence, the first time people lean against these objects, they are literally not prepared to push through. And inside the structure is completely pitch black space. So there's this point of transformation, if you like, where you're on the outside, you think this is fun, it looks like a bouncy castle, we can play in the art gallery, but then there is this transition moment where you fall into pitch black darkness and you're having to orient yourself. Now, once you've done it once, of course, that initial idea of the work is radically recast as it becomes an absolutely insane madhouse, particularly for kids under the age of 14 who attempt to do ever more increasingly ridiculous things with it. So, in a sense, it's a work that tries to play on a multitude of levels. It's a work that, that benefits from an individual experience, uh, from you being alone in the space and from you playing with what the parameters of the work are but it also benefits as well from the kind of maniacal energies that can be brought about by people. Now, one thing, just before I do move on, is one of my favorite stories of this work was that, again, a, a woman came into the space, it was very early in the morning, and she would have been probably in her early 80s. And most people go up and they press the object and they peer in and they try and figure out what's going on with the work. But this woman, bizarrely, just w took her shoes off and then just ran straight at it at speed and disappeared in. And it was the most beautiful thing. Coming back to what Bruce was talking about in terms of aesthetics, for me, it was one of the most beautiful things I've been able to elicit in my work. You will have seen out the front, this object is sitting out there in the courtyard. This is a work called Bounce. And it was a fairly early work for me, but it was really interested again in trying to build what I call a critical transition. I'm really fascinated as an artist in the way that we build distances from people and from objects. And I would say that one of the things that's consistent in my practice is trying to invent ever more complicated ways to disarm people, to enable them to be unguarded, even if it's just for a moment. And this work bounces, as you can see from out the front, it's a reasonably large inflatable structure of a fairly uncertain shape. Like the shape is not necessarily clear what it is. But I'll, talk, I'll walk you through it to give you a sense. So from above, the structure looks like this, and you climb and you jump on it. But as you get closer to it, you realize that I'm inside it with my eyes looking out the top. 
And that moment where you've transitioned from thinking, fun in the gallery, this is great, bounce, chaos and craziness, to a sense that suddenly there is a person inside, this, this object has been anthropomorphized. Um, that moment, that uncanny moment, is what I try and, and, and unfold in the project. It's like a Gordian knot is, is engaged with. And the work shifts from being about pleasure and fun to being something potentially sinister to something that's about scopic relationships, etc. Now, this is a work, it's a performance work, so I do it for eight hours for the opening time of the gallery, that the gallery's open. And it is an especially dangerous work, as I'm sure you'll appreciate. Um, I can remember once, uh, very early in the piece when I did this work, uh, a guy was sitting on top of me and he was looking at me and he started to poke my eyes with his fingers like this. <laughs> now, of course, you know, he knew that I was a, a real person inside the object. And then, um, just because that wasn't enough, he decided to lift his elbow up and break my nose with that movement. And the extraordinary sense of violence that, that I wasn't quite prepared for, though the work is prefaced in such a way where any response is, is is, you know, something that I have to take on board. But what was most disturbing was when I looked over in the corner of my eye, there was a little girl sitting there on, on the other side of the work. So she watched this all transpire. So I think for me, again, the, the centrality of a project like this is that what it's trying to do is that it's giving a space around which people can perform. And it is, in a sense, opening out a kind of unmediated experience for them to engage with me. The fact of the violence was pretty confronting, but at the same time, many experiences of the work weren't at all about violence. And I think it's somehow across those registers that I'm really interested. I didn't necessarily want to have to have my nose broken to be able to garner the unguarded moment of that person, but that's the way the work rolled. Okay, and that's another sense of it. You can see the little eye slots up there where I am. This is a, a more recent project, and in a sense it was designed as a response, uh, or it was a very particular response to the bounce work. What was fascinating to me about bounce was the way in which visual surveillance of other people elicited different kinds of behaviours. So the fact that you could have, in this work, people watching one another, it really transitioned what they did, or licences to behave in particular ways. So I was very fascinated about how I might be able to use these inflatable structures, these sort of crazy architectural Hitchcockian spaces, how I might be able to utilise that to take away from the idea of groups of people egging each other on and interacting with one another to an, um, a one-on-one -on -one experience. Now this work's called Hold, it's a really large structure. The audience is invited one at a time to enter the space and you can see the person entering there. They walk up the left-hand side ramp, and when they get to the top, they see this arm sticking through the wall, which is my arm. And the only way that they can proceed in this work is if they take my arm, because there's a ledge about this wide, and then there's a three and a half meter drop to the ground. So the only way that this work can proceed is if they take this disembodied arm and walk with me along the course of the ledge. Yes, people fall off. <laughs> but if they get to the end of the ledge, they then end up in an interior space, and the arm appears again, this time on the other side of the structure. Now, because it's so dark, I can't show you images of that. What actually happens is the work is exactly identical. For the first part, the uh, audience is walking on a ledge, and the second part, I'm walking on a ledge, and they're holding my arm. And if they let go of me, I fall and I crash to the ground. So it's a difficult work, in a sense, to try and show you visually. But what it is about, fundamentally, is it's about the idea of trust. And it is about phobia and fear and overcoming those ideas. And it's using a structure, an architectural structure, simply as a mechanism to enable me to have a closer connection with an audience member. Now, it might seem a strange aspiration for a work like this to talk about intimacy, but I needed a space that was that large and that complex with the different resonances that it had simply for me to be able to find a way to build an intimacy with another person. And that intimacy is not based on conversation or looking at one another. The intimacy is all predicated on my arm holding their arm and trying to understand all the information that might be transmitted as we move our way through the space. 
Okay, so aside from making very large projects, I'm also interested in the public sphere and how structures like this might activate a public context rather than the kind of privileged, rarefied space of the gallery. The galleries don't like my work because people can touch them and they can engage with them and they can get injured in them. And let me tell you, they do get injured. Um, a very funny moment in this particular project, which I can only laugh about in hindsight, is a woman fell off, shouldn't have been on the work, and she broke her leg. And to enter into this work, there was a long corridor and there was an audience of about 100 waiting to get in. And you can hear the ambulance in the distance. And then suddenly the gurney bursts down the corridor. And you can imagine 100 people waiting to go in. It disappears into the space, puts the woman on the gurney, and out they go. And she goes out back through the audience. And the audience are just looking absolutely terrified, like, what the hell is this? And the woman's going, don't worry, it's great, it's great. <laughs> With her broken leg. OK, so this is a work called Pump. Uh, it's a very small work. And again, it's also interested in similar ideas, but just on a much more micro scale. Um, there is, in this work, it's a kind of push-me-pull-you project. And it's designed for people to put their head into the structure and to pump. So we pump away. And the only way that we can see each other, which we can see um, down through this little almost yellow lounge room, is if we both pump at the right degree. So if we pump too fast, the thing swells up and it hurts our head. But if we don't pump enough, we have this flaccid problem where we can't see one another. So again, it's an interest in trying to find ways in which an object can build a rhythm, if you like, or a kind of a system that enables me to have an interaction and a conversation without saying anything. I'm not interested in that idea of conversation as a strategy. I'm much more interested in that haptic and that rhythmic and that durational element around which the, the way that you pump the time that you hold onto the structure for uh, is a revealing sense of an exchange, an interchange of one kind or another. It's a lovely point with this where I was pumping away and I heard this scratching sound. I thought, what the hell is that? And um, I didn't know about this till after the work had finished, but this little girl wasn't tall enough to pump away, so she grabbed a milk crate and she stuck her head on it. And I was trying to figure out, why am I doing all the work? You know, Why is this happening? This little girl was being very ingenious in, in engaging with the work, which was really beautiful for me. OK, I'm going to talk about two more projects, and then I'll try and synthesize to some degree. This is a, a work. Uh, it's called Pause. And it was done recently at Mona in Tasmania, um, but first done in Prague in 2011. And again, this work has a similar resonance to the whole project in that it's also dealing with the fragmented body and what we might learn from the fragmented body. It's an inflated tower. It's a very large tower that uh, people are invited to climb up on one at a time. And when they get to the top of the tower, they slide themselves down. This is a pair of hands sticking out at the end, which is my hands. So I'm inside the structure. All you can see of them is my hands. And my aspiration is to hold that person in space and let them, and let them fly in space, literally, to deny. To deny their weight and float in space is a great modernist sculptural aspiration. Um, but of course, there's the phobia of getting four meters up high and lowering yourself down. And there's also the phobia of the three meter drop to the ground below. And the, the whole sense of this work is the information that is transmitted from my hands, from their feet. So I don't hear them, I don't see them but I understand whatever I can understand is, is experienced through the sense of touch. And I wait for that very final second where they feel comfortable. So that on my hands, and it could take 10 seconds or it could take 30 seconds or it could take a minute, but that very second where they relax, I go bang, and they drop to the floor. And that's so much about that idea of that instant, that instantaneous transition. Uh, and I do think that for me, as a researcher, I'm fundamentally trying to find ever more complex ways, but at the same time dealing with really simple languages of how I can find out more about what make, makes people tick, how I can find out more about decision-making processes and try and unlock that sense of when I can be able to activate that unguarded moment. Okay, the last project I wanted to talk about uh, is a public artwork. This is called Drift. Uh, and it looks like a long, yellow, slightly weird sci-fi style object. It was located in Tata Square in Sydney. 
and it involved the um, audience, the people of the street, anyone that wanted to do it, to walk up the length of that structure till they got to the top where it is enclosed. And when they get to the top of it, there's a little um, tube uh, that they sit on, and then before they know it, they get sucked into this tube at great speed. And there's some experience of the work is less than a second as they get spat out the other end. But what happens in the process is that they don't realise that that yellow object is actually connected to the Taylor Square water fountain. So unbeknownst to them, as they kind of go flying off into it, is that the random sequencing of the water fountain might be spraying water all over them, or it may not. It also goes pitch black in there. So we transition from the kind of swirling multiplicities of Taylor Square, the kind of chaos of Darlinghurst, into this yellow kind of carnival-style space, less than a second through a kind of sphere of darkness and weirdness, potentially saturated with water, before you spat back out into the city of Sydney. And this is very much for me about how I can garner a kind of moment or intensity of, of trans transformation in a very difficult and complex social site. Um, I'll finish with a story just to maybe give you a sense of how these works are not disconnected from the kind of complex social milieu of where they operate. Um, that little area there is called Gilligan's Island, and the, one of the biggest homeless communities in Sydney live on that island. They socialise on that island, and my artwork was in their backyard. And the whole time that this work happened, there was just consistent events with police and drugs and violence and all sorts of stuff going on and around it. But what was amazing is that the group of people that actually lived on that space ended up taking ownership of the work. And there was one guy, Mark, who um, was a homeless guy. He was um, recently um, out of prison. He had no teeth and he was certainly brain damaged. But Mark absolutely loved this work. The problem for Mark is that he simply couldn't get the rules. So you couldn't tell Mark when he could or couldn't go on the work. And so I had this moment where a little girl was on the top and she'd just gone down. And just as the little girl went down, Mark came running up at speed, up the platform, and decided he didn't want to do any of this nonsense with the little tube. He just wanted to go straight down. So Mark dived head first at speed. And he bypassed the little girl in the tube halfway down, which was a really great feat of physics. He spat himself at the end and disappeared off 15 metres into the middle of Darlinghurst intersection. And he kind of came to a very messy end over near the magistrate's court. And of course, I thought Mark had just about killed himself because of the traffic, but he was lying on the other side of the road with his hands behind his back with a great big smile on his face. And um, that's maybe a good point to finish. Thanks, everybody.